I can't do a whole coffee morning without any water. How are you, everybody? Good morning on this beautiful sunny day. Wow, I'm looking out the garden and I can see the promise of summer. Is it the same where you are? First of all, everybody, just tell me where you are. Where are you in the world? Just one word, where you are. I love seeing where people are across the country and abroad. Obviously, you can't do this if you're watching. This is an upload because this is live at the moment. Good morning. How are we? It's a bit dark down this end today. How are we? Liverpool, Sidcup, says Tricia. Oh, my dad went to um, drama college in Sidcup. Martina, Hilltown, Israel. Who's that from Israel? Wow, you're, uh, it's, it's crazy over in Israel at the moment, isn't it? Natasha Milchin is in Israel. Uh, Devon, says Emma, Sazzle, morning. Michelle is in Essex, Leeds, Seven Oaks. Let me have a look down here. Easier. Um, morning, Faith, and thank you for your love to all the family. Uh, Claire Ross Reed is in Dorset. God, have you seen about the oil leak in Paul Harper? That was the first thing I saw this morning because I knew I was doing coffee moaning this morning, literally before my eyes were even properly open. I was looking at the news and I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, uh, morning, Ali P. Morning, Jan Number, Hampshire, Oxfordshire, Dorset, Beckenham, uh, South Lanarkshire, um, Cumbria, Cotswolds, Worcestershire, Rutland, Perth, West Australia. Yay, look at those sunshines. Um, gorgeous, all over the place. And I think most places it's sunny. Hazelmere, Surrey, Rickmansworth. Uh, it is mad in Israel. Not sure how I'll get back home today. I'm in a different city, says Natasha Milchin. Yeah, there are riots, major riots in, um, or demonstrations in Israel. Uh, morning from Wales in Sunset. I used to go to Wales quite a lot. Uh, Ramsgate, Sweden, Swindon. Cardiff, Winchmore Hill, West Norwood, truly scrumptious, South on sea Hackney, South Shield, Auckland, New Zealand. Wow, uh, London Bridge. You're at London Bridge? So you, you don't live in London Bridge, Julie. Or you work or you work in, or what are you doing in London Bridge? Sunny Birmingham. Hello, how are you? I was just saying over on, on Instagram, I had a bit of a wild weekend. We all went out, all the loose women went out uh, and the production team to celebrate our lovely Tom Sage, who's, I, I named Head of Women. That's not an official title. He was Deputy Editor of Loose Women. And uh, he's going off to Neighbours. He's going to Australia. Because not only was he like, the, you know, he's a really good friend, but like I said to him, now we look forward to the rest of our friendship for the rest of our life without having to be a little bit cautious because we both work together. Um, so that's going to be really nice. But yeah, had a great time. It was just, yeah, just kicked off my shoes. Thought, yeah, we're having a few drinks. Me and Kay stayed in a hotel for the night so we could stay up drinking tea when we got back and dissect the day. It was just, it was just lovely. It was really, it felt like the old days. Um, I'm just saying, don't know if you saw Loose Women on Friday, but oh my God, Judy was bloody hilarious. She had me dance, she had me up doing a sexy dance. <laughs> it was just so funny. And if you weren't watching it, you, if you'd have seen behind the cameras all the security guards and everybody was dancing, it was just fantastic. Fridays is definitely my favourite day on Loose Women. Because um, <clears throat> we're allowed to be a, just a little bit looser, a little bit sillier. Uh, yeah, the Neighbours is coming back. And our lovely Tom Sage was headed up the campaign over in the UK to bring it back. Now we've bloody lost him to the bloody show. Very annoying. No, I'm glad for him, though. It's a good... Um, it's a great thing to happen, isn't it? Go and live in Australia for a year. Uh, Julie had a wonderful 65th birthday weekend with family and friends. Julie Hilton, happy blooming birthday. I'm going to be 60 next year. I just can't. Believe it! 60! Lucky me. Oh, God, whenever I do these, I, you know, I'm always doing... I do these sort of batches of interviews every so often. I do, like, three or four, five interviews in one sort of block. And, th and there's always something that everybody will ask me. So whether it's about body confidence, whether it's about marriage, whatever. But the new one at the moment is, how do you feel about being 60 next year? <laughs> 
Well, the first interview I went, oh, God, am I? I didn't even know I was going to be 60. Um, this was a couple of months ago. Um, and my answer is always the same. What a bloody privilege to get to 60 because I have friends now at this point that are fighting for their lives, literally, with bloody, bloody breast cancer. God, cancer sucks. And, and I just think it's a privilege. So anyone that's worrying about, oh, I'm going to be six or oh, I'm going to be 40 or I'm going to be 30, just remember it's a privilege. It's an amazing thing. And that will get you through any fears about wrinkles and schminkles and all of that stuff. And achy knees. And <laughs> just think, wow, God, think of all the people that didn't make it. Um, okay, so... We've got a few things, quite a few things to talk about today. <clears throat> Whether we'll get through them all, I don't know. What do you want me to start with? There we go. On the, on the list today, what would you like me to start with? Happy birthday, Catherine Rumsey. Let's do a quick happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Catherine. Happy birthday to you. If there's anyone else's birthday, I'll sing at the end. Just let me know. Um... Uh, so, guys, what do you want me to start with? Come on, somebody choose. Somebody be produced today. Ah, oh, the dementia story, says Wonder Woman. Well, yes, I mean, I have to say, this really did catch my eye. And it, it was interesting why it so caught my eye was because just before it on the radio, this is, this is the headline I saw, Porsche billionaire... Moves in with girlfriend after divorcing dementia sufferer wife. Now, very mirror headline. Now, why this caught my eye was just, just before that, this ad that I was listening to on the radio, I think it was for Dementia UK or Alzheimer's UK, and it was very, very sort of bleak, you know, would you still look after, you know, would you still love Barry, even though Barry is not, you know, is nothing like the man that you met, would you still do? It was very, very bleak, you know, in your darkest hours of your life. And I was just, I, I just stopped in my tracks as I was getting dressed and I was thinking, you know, because I always say one of my favourite vows in marriage is in sickness and in health, because that is the nub of all of it, isn't it? How we care for each other in the in the really dark and difficult times of our marriage. And I certainly feel that when... You know, when I've supported Mark through his really dark stuff and when he rushes to me and my really dark stuff. And it feels like a very, a very beautiful thing about marriage. Very beautiful thing. Um, and of course, Alzheimer's, dementia, when you are literally losing that person. So it's like that person becomes somebody else. And we've seen these beautiful films, haven't we, on in, on social media where you know, people, this this incredible love that, that continues on for some. But of course, it's an incredibly brutal condition, not only for the person that is suffering it, but for the people around them. Incredibly hard. It's not all, you know, there can be all sorts of things. That, you know, a friend of ours, mum who had Alzheimer's, became incredibly aggressive, incredibly frightening violent, all these sorts of things. And then when you add to it the pressures, the financial pressures that somebody might have to look after that person, you know, they need 24-hour care, <coughs> you know, you've got to, you, you've still got to work, you might have other dependents. It's not just as simple as just, just love will endure. And it's, I, I have never judged anyone that's, ha or would I ever, that would have to have carers or have that person put into a home where they could be cared for better. I have no judgment on that whatsoever. And now, you know, Mark gets annoyed with me because I always say, oh, if I have any, anything like that, you know, just, just, I don't want you looking after me. And he goes, it's so horrible because I love you and you're just saying that and you're determining my future. And so we always have big discussions around this. And I think it's good to have these discussions. Anyway, so... So I'd been listening to this advert and then I'd been having this dialogue with myself and then I saw this headline and I was just like, wow, 
Wow. So apparently they've been together since 2007, got married at 2019. This is uh, what's he, this is the guy, Wolfgang Porsche, billionaire. And apparently he has, you know, moved in with somebody else, which again, that's fine. But did he really need to divorce her? I just feel that's so brutal, isn't it? I mean, especially when you're so well off. You know, could you not just... I mean, I don't know. Maybe he is caring for her financially. I, I, we don't know. This is, you know, this is a... You know, this is a newspaper article. We're not hearing the man talk for himself. So parking his story, because I don't want to judge somebody when I don't really know their story. I, it just really, it really focused me on it, on the question. I thought I could not in a million years imagine divorcing somebody. So what, you, 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 you're overwhelmed, it's all too much, you can't, you can't cope anymore, you're not looking after this person that you love in the way that they need to be, and you, you move them into a home, absolutely. But then to divorce them, I don't know, there's something about it that just feels... I don't know, just brutal. But am I being silly? What do you think? What do you think? I was really upset by it. Mark was as well. He was like, oh my God, actually, just, just divorce the person. Because think of all the other people around that person that loves them as well. Like your, your mutual friends, their family. I don't know if she's got children or whatever. The children, how does that feel? To just cut that person off, to just divorce them. Uh, right, Angela Thompson, this is interesting. I love my husband, but I'd rather he divorce me than have to live, you, live his retirement financially supporting me in illness. Both my parents had dementia, so I don't want him not living his life. And Angela, this is exactly what I say to Mark. I say, you know, just just do whatever you need to do and don't think about me again and da-da-da. And, and as I said, you know, as I just said, Mark gets really upset by that. He goes, I don't want you to say that. I don't want you to determine how I love you or how I look after you or whatever. But I feel that. I feel that burden ahead of time. So I get you, Angela. But it's just the divorce bit. And, you know... There is something weird about us, Angela, I'm saying us, because that's two of us now, that says that. Because I, you know, here's me saying I love most, I love the vow in sickness and in health, but I'm not wanting Mark to love that vow. <laughs> it's a bit screwed up, isn't it? Um, Zoe, I don't know how you could move on with someone else, knowing your wife or husband was suffering in that way, depressing. Um, uh I th welcome to the man family. I think, Nadia, sometimes people just aren't the same as they were when they were married. People change. But it could, but would be good to see the true reason if he's moved on. Why stay married? I don't know. Yeah. Well, again, it is like we say, we don't know the full picture. We don't know what sort of situation, what sort of relationship they had before and all of that. But I was just taking it more to myself. I was thinking, I couldn't do that. I know I couldn't do that. I couldn't. If I couldn't look after Mark properly and I, I, I had to put him in a home, I, I would do that. But there's no way I could divorce him. No way. I just, I just couldn't live with myself. Amanda Roach, most dementia patients don't know they're suffering. It's the worst. Yeah, it's just so brutal. Yeah. My late, Joe Osler, my late dad was a saint for how he cared for his wife, my mum at home when she had dementia, yeah. And that would have been so hard for you as well, watching your dad under the strain of it as well. It's just, and, and I think some people do, out of a sense of duty, you know, actually make themselves ill. So it is important to get help when you need help. And it is important to... Um, to not feel any guilt when you have to put them in a home because I was talking to a friend of mine just the other day that was saying this and still saying that she still felt guilty and I was like, God, how? There's no, what? There's no way you could have looked after your mother. Just no way. With everything else on your plate, you did the best thing for her. She, you could not have cared for her properly. So, yeah. Anyway, just caught my eye that. Right. Nitrous oxide... 
Well, first of all, we're going to talk about nitrous oxide, and then I want to talk about Rishi Sunak's immediate justice plan, which is part of this, uh, the NOS, the nitrous oxide. Right, does everybody know what NOS is? Um, oh, Anita, does she? Sending you a big hug. So hard for you and for your mum and for everyone. Um, so, who knows about NOS? NOS, 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 NOS. Does anybody know about this? Nitrous oxide. You know the little, you, you'll have probably seen them, the little silver canisters that are just lying around everywhere in the parks. We find them in our drive every morning, which I find so bloody annoying. Um, they are just everywhere, in the gutters, aren't they? Along the street, just piles of them. Anne, Anne Murray says, yes, laughing gas. Um, yeah, it is awful stuff, and it is absolutely, for years now, has been a huge thing with young people. It's very, very accessible. Well, soon not to be, because they're going to ban it. Um, yeah, it is, it is what they mix with general anaesthetic. Somebody said etanox, if you're in labour, good shit, lollipop. Is, is that what they use it for? Is it, is it, well, so these, are, these little canisters, they're actually used for in, in baking, they're used for, um, for, you know, spray cream, used in all sorts of things. But unfortunately, they have become very popular over the last few years. Mark was just saying, actually, that he did it once when he was in um, at uni. And it's like a 15 second, 10 seconds, something like that high. And it's just like, you know, just like euphoria for like 10 seconds. You could giggle, you could have a bit of a giggling fit, hence why it's called laughing gas. Um, and apart from all of that, it is extremely dangerous. <laughs> and the problem is, when somebody does one, they want another one because the high is so quick and burns out so fast. And, um, you know, talking to various young people over the weekend about it and they're saying the thing is yeah all young people know about the risk but it's classic they just don't think it's going to happen to them um a friend of um of mark's a friend of mark's daughter uh ended up getting a massive um deficiency in b12 anemia because it can cause anemia but also one shot, if you get the wrong brain in the wrong moment, can cause spinal injuries. Can you believe that? And yet this has been going on for so long, these piles of these things everywhere. Now corner shops are selling them. They don't even ask. Loads of them at raves. Yeah, Pam PMS. Um, so it causes anemia, nerve damage, massive B12 deficiency. So it's good. It's it's a good thing to have a conversation with your kids about. We have over the years had conversations with them about it. Uh, so they're marketed in boxes labelled called labelled cream chargers because uh, that's one of the complete innocent uses for it. So you know it's the it's like the propellant to whip cream. Uh, also, you can use it, it can be used to get more oxygen into car engine, helping it go faster. When combined with options, also use an anaesthetic in medical and dental settings, or maybe that's what people are talking about when you're in labour. Um, so they this 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 so Sky went undercover. You could just buy them in corner shops really easily. Anyone in a corner shop selling that? Why are you selling it? Why are you selling it? Um, none of the shops asked how old or who, what they were buying them for. Uh, every shop added in a packet of par party balloons. Because that's how you take it. I think you put it into the balloon and then suck it out of the balloon. Can you believe that? Um, so it's being banned. Um, and it's like Maddie just said, well, how's that going to work for all the people that use it for their bakeries? I don't know. I wonder if there's going to be some sort of licence for it so that if you do need it for your business, I don't know, maybe. But this is all, the pl all part of Rishi Sunak's immediate justice scheme to combat antisocial behaviour. So, <laughs> you can tell they're starting to rev up for election time, aren't they? Y you know, here we go. This is classic 
Tory whipping up. He wrote this for the Mail. He wrote this as a piece for the Daily Mail. Um, so <laughs> you got to laugh. You got to laugh at this one. I just want to. I just want to drill into this one. So one of the one of the uh, recommendations for this new immediate justice um, idea is that offenders, graffiti offenders, will get in. The public will get immediate justice because within 48 hours, they will be put into either a high-vis jacket, wait for it, or a jumpsuit, and ordered to clean off the graffiti. <laughs> In an attempt to show that justice is being done, so, cleaning up graffiti, litter picking or washing police cars have all been given as possible punishments. Right, now, first of all, I'm a great believer in more community service. I think putting young people too quickly into prison, and I've spoken to a lot of young people that have gone into prison, they said it's amazing how quickly you can get used to it and how much you can learn. <laughs> Um, and prisons are full. Prisons are dangerous places. Prisons, you can learn all sorts of things. There's a huge problem with drugs in prisons. And what, what does it really, how does it really serve us? So I think more community service. I don't think we need to put people in high-vis jumpsuits and all of that. I really don't because I think it's already humiliating enough. And it's hard. You know, community service, when you get like 100 hours of like cleaning up parks and doing all that, that is like... It's not pleasant. It really isn't pleasant. And I think if you were to match that alongside some really proper good youth work, I think that would be good, where you're actually trying to set people back on a better road. For our future, what is justice for a society? A justice, justice means a better society. So does society get justice when somebody is just thrown into jail and then they come back out and then they repeat the same behaviour. Of course not. There's no justice for society. A uh, straight jacket on laughing gas, says Anne Murray. So I'm a believer in more community service where possible to do things that, that really, um, you know, serve society. Like you say, you know, working in parks, when they see them cleaning up all the parks and, and planting flower, doing all of that. But I just wanted to drill into this a bit. So... Where are all the bobbies on the beat that are going to catch these people? <laughs> Mixed graffiti. <laughs> so if you've got those spare police, could they at all, possibly, Rishi, could they put at all, could it be possible for them to go out and just protect us a bit more? Like, so that there wouldn't be quite so much sexual assault. So we wouldn't have to fear rape in quite the way that we do every time we go. So that we didn't... So maybe if there's more bobbies on the beat, there could be more people out and about so there aren't so many people stabbed. Because think of the amount of people that it's going to take to make sure these people are caught mid-graffiti. I mean, this is just headline stuff, isn't it? <laughs> Have you ever witnessed anyone doing graffiti? <laughs> we haven't, have we? It's always just like, oh, wow. Actually, an awful lot of graffiti I actually love and I think it's incredibly creative and I think it's young people without much else to do doing something artistic. Okay, obviously it's different when it's a... <clears throat> but... Um, so, the Prime Minister's intervention confirms that antisocial behaviour is emerging as a central battleground for the next election. All of what we are suffering with crime in this country at the moment, the ludicrous situation that we've got that most of us know that is probably not even worth um, ringing the police if our car stolen, if our house is burgled, because nothing's going to be done. That we want to hear about. How are you going to make the streets safer for us? And, and I just thought, oh, God, is this what we're just going to hear, like, trotted out all the way through the election, the run-up to the election? Oh. Labour, apparently, is going to tackle drug dealing, boost the numbers of neighbourhood police. We, well, believe it when we see it. We've got a huge problem with that, haven't we? Recruiting. 
when we recruit too fast, we get some very dodgy people in uniform. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So the system is going to be tested in 10 areas before it is rolled out across England and Wales. While there is little detail on exactly how victims and communities will be involved in setting punishments. There we go. Little detail, very little detail. Why do we think that is? Because it will appeal, this headline, to be, oh, guess jolly good. Sort out these people with the graffiti. Yes, that's what we know. Let's get Cots the Cotswolds cleaned up again. You know. Oh, it... I, I just, and the thing is, like, so many people will fall for that, you know. Our, our, the problems go so, so much deeper than that, so much deeper than that. People are struggling in so many different ways. Um, we've got huge problems, but hey, let's put people in jumpsuits and get them cleaning the graffiti off. That'll make everything better. Is anyone excited about the possibility? Yeah. Catch real kill killers and criminals. Make us feel a bit safer. Let us know that if somebody burgles our house two or three times and we've got them on the bloody ring doorbell. Somebody was telling me this the other day. They've actually got the shots of the burglars and still the police have done absolutely bugger all. Let us know. Say to us, we are going to guarantee that every single time somebody's car is stolen from outside their house or their house is burgled, a policeman is going to come and see them and talk to them. You know, where do young people go where it's safe? There's no activities, no youth clubs. I know this sounds old-fashioned, but I don't care. I think that really makes sense. A friend of mine who lives in Brighton was saying that, um, that recently... This vicar, new vicar, she's not religious at all, but she, I don't know how she bumped into him, got talking to him, and he started a youth club like the old days in his um, village, in, in the sort of hall bit, you know, the church hall. And kids are coming, loads of them, and they're playing music and they're like having... <laughs> Her kid down and went down and blasted hard rock for the whole two hours at one point, which is hilarious, but you know... Give, give kids somewhere to go. Maybe they won't all be sn sniffing NOS in the park. Um, I used to love going to the youth club back in the 80s. Oh, God. I mean, yeah. Who else went to a youth club in the 80s? Who here is too young to even know what a youth club was? Bobby's on the beat. That's what everybody wants. But no, no government can do anything about it. And no government can do anything about childcare costs. No government ever has for how many decades now? Not Labour, not Tory, nobody has sorted out the ridiculous... And you're talking to us about graffiti! <laughs> uh, uh, Countess Carly, you know, maybe put myself out there. Oop, oop, oop. But some parents need to stop making excuses and parent their children. Well, exactly. But those are the children that I worry about. It's not the children that have got parents that will. It's the ch children in chaos. And the thing is, why should they be punished without being aided? Because if you're not being parented properly, that's not your fault. That's not the young person's fault, is it? That's what's so awful. And do we really think that just by humiliating or throwing them in prison, that we're going to get a better society. No. No, we're not. Um, what else? Um, what? Oh, I've only got a minute or so left. So I think I'm going to go with, because we've had some lots of difficult ones there. Have you had your five a day? <clears throat> How many hugs... Do you think you have per day, per week, per month, per year? Because a lot of people don't get even a hug a day. But but if you're in a relationship, apparently the secret to a better relationship at any age is five hugs a day. And then they've got pictures of Barack Obama and Biden and Jennifer, and not Jennifer Aniston, what's her name? Jennifer Lopez. Um, now there are real, there are real reasons for this. Apparently... Five, day, five hugs a day boosts your happiness hormones. Who knows what the happiness hormone is? Oxytocin. 
oxytocin, oxytocin. It's what we get um, in the good bits of childbirth. Um, so people that have more hugs have higher levels of oxytocin, the so-called love home hormone, and <clears throat> lower blood pressure in women. Daily hug hugging was a predictive of lower markers of chronic inflammation. So this seriously makes a difference for your health because inflammation is what causes, causes disease, right? Um, hardly any ever since COVID. Mm, Craterholic, you have to, what, are you, you all remember, aren't you, on the Sunday show, to, uh, this Sunday, you have to hear what Dina says about this regarding Zach Bush. Um, so aim for a five second hug. Zach Bush is a doctor and he talks a lot about how we need to start hugging people again. He hugs everybody he meets just for a few seconds to, for his microbiome in his gut because he believes our immune systems are like, well, we all, we all know that. We need, we need more. We need more of other people. We need more varied variety in our diet. We need more earth. We need so much to strengthen our immune system. And one of those things today is hugging. Um, so there's no such thing as the perfect hug. Um, the long hug, the brief hug, the bear hug, from behind hug, the neck waist hug, the crisscross hug, the light hug, the big squeeze. But five seconds is what we're aiming for. But if you can only do it for one second, that's fine. It's better than nothing. <laughs> um, uh, either one second or five seconds. The consensus was five seconds was a good amount. Four to six seconds is the optimum length. But long hugs, keep doing what you're doing. Ten seconds is great too. I'm just trying to think. One and two and three and four. It's quite a long time. Five seconds. <laughs> my husband would think my early dementia has started if I started hugging him five times a day. <laughs> well, why don't you just start? Why don't you? Why don't any, anybody in a relationship? Do you know what as well? Self hugging. Actually, self hug. If you're not in a relationship, if you self hug and rock, it is actually gorgeous. I do this when I get anxious. Don't tell Mark. He doesn't know. I will do this and I literally and I pat myself like this have you seen little babies when they do that when they pat themselves it's so sweet so you can literally just just rock slightly and just hug yourself pat like that just like you would and it's not about trying to pretend someone is hugging you I find it's just me self-soothing self -soothing. like right now I've got a really nice feeling Go on, just try it now. Just put your arms around yourself. Try the pat if you don't like the pat. And just like gently rock. Close your eyes. Oh, I'm listening to the birds in the garden at the same time. Oh, it's so nice. It's so nice. If you've got, if you're, if you're with some miserable bastard or some, some... <laughs> <coughs> Not just a man, could be some miserable woman as well who just doesn't like hugging or doesn't, or you feel doesn't doesn't like you enough. Do it yourself. <laughs> You're not coming in a straight jacket. Says. It's so. I stroke my hair like a child. Oh my god, Joanne, that's so lovely. I hadn't thought of that. It's so nice. I think if I stroke my hair, that might make me cry. I might get a bit too upset. Is any, did anybody just try that? Put your hand up. Oh no, Danielle needs that today. Her car's going in for an MOT. <laughs> even the briefest touch, back to couples, even the briefest touch can help to bond couples. Um, so not everyone is a hugger, right? Not everyone likes it. And he allows for that, this guy, Bansi. So couples should speak up about how much they need a hug or a cuddle or enjoy physical contact and be sensitive to their partner's needs. It's very easy to assume it's quantity and we should give more touch all of the time. It's more, no, no, sorry, sorry, that's wrong, sorry, sorry. It's more about aligning the touch you're sharing with someone to their desires and your desires. So basically, if you really, if your partner is really uncomfortable with hugging, 
It's about trying to have that conversation about what else could you do. Like, it's okay to just hold somebody's hands. Like, did you used to hold your partner's hand, like when you watch telly, or even just put your hand on their hand? Kay says, I'm one of those really annoying people that does it for too long and it makes it awkward. Her and Jane said that about me. I felt a bit sad when they said that. <laughs> me and Judy don't. Me and Judy sit like this and make me hug. I like Judy because she does loads of touching and so do I. But I didn't grow up with a lot of that. So I, so I, I decided I was going to be a hugger. I literally made the decision that I was going to be a hugger. Um, yeah, group hub remembering Xander. That's a nice thing to say. Um, oh, has he? Prince Harry has just arrived at the court in London. Oh, is this again, is this the papers thing? But anyway, I've got to go. There's lots more on this article about kissing, about all sorts of things. So if you want to read, it's in the Times today. Um, I notice how Biden and his wife hug all the time. They always look so in love, don't they? Right, group hug for Xander. Group hug, everybody. And for those of you that don't know, Xander um, sadly died. Oh, it's so weird saying it, so I can't believe it. And he was one of our really, one of our, a very focal point of our community. Um, he often thought very differently to all of us. But um, yeah, he was a great guy, smart and funny and always here. He was always here. And yes, um, sadly, he, he died. So we do every so often do a hug and do a little memory for him and his family. So group hug. Lots of love, guys. Um, keep your eyes open. Uh, this week, we're going to do a live uh, vlog, which we haven't done for ages. A live vlog. Maybe Wednesday night, but we will give you enough notice. All right, my lovelies. See you tomorrow. Bye.